Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the 78th Asian Impact Webinar. My name is Silvia Garcia Mandico and I'm an economist at the Economic Research and Development Impact uh, Department of the Asian Development Bank. I will be taking you through today's webinar, the second of a series that unravels the four dimensions of old age well of well-being uh, at older ages, presented in the Asian Development Policy Report of this year, Aging Well in Asia. Two more webinars are forthcoming in the coming months, so stay tuned for those. Today's webinar focuses on economic security at older ages, and of course, this hinges on addressing financial preparedness for retirement and the crucial role of pensions. We have four speakers with us today. Pip O'Keefe, Professor of Practice, UNS. W Business School in Sydney and Director of the Aging Asia Research Fab, ARC Center of Excellence in Population Aging and Research, CIPAR. Rafael Chomik, Senior Research Fellow at CIPAR and UNSW Business School. Long Lang, Professor at National Economics University in Hanoi, Senior Researcher, Institute of Social and Medical Studies and Affiliate Research Fellow at Oxford Institute of Population Aging at the University of Oxford. And lastly, Aiko Kikawa, Senior Economist at the Economic Research and Development Impact Department of the Asian Development Bank and lead of this year's Asian Development Policy Report, Aging Well in Asia. Thank you all for joining us. So we will start this webinar with a presentation by Rafael Chomit, followed by a, a panel discussion with Q&A from the audience. Please add your questions to the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we will get to them during the discussion. Please, Rafael, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Thank you very much. OK, I think I'm on. Um, so thank you very much to the ADB, and thanks to Aiko and Tom for commissioning and guiding this paper, uh, which, as mentioned, was a background document for the last Asian Development Policy Report. Thanks to co-authors Pip and John as well, particularly Pip, who's here on the panel, uh, no doubt prepared to field some of the more difficult questions. Uh, so we're talking about pensions in Asia, and I'll talk about it in four parts. I'll give you an intro to the context and the structural design of pension systems. I'll talk about each of the two main types of schemes, the contributory and social pensions, uh, their current issues and opportunities. And then I'll set out uh, other items for the Asian pension reform agenda. And here's the preview of the conclusions. The main theme is that pensions in the region see low coverage and low adequacy, some of it by design and some of it by circumstance. With contributory pensions, some tinkering is possible to bring people in and raise coverage and contributions. We call this the low hanging fruit, ready for the plucking, but actually it's likely to only see marginal improvements. For this reason, social pensions remain an urgent priority for the region. There's an opportunity there to expand coverage, increase benefits, and ensure appropriate targeting. We then cap it off with the range of seven other policy considerations, such as gender, incentives, sustainability adjustments, and technology. So first up, the context. To many of you, it's well known that the emerging Asia faces a constellation of challenges uh, and that these manifest in very unique ways in the region. Firstly, many of its economies are seeing some of the fastest demographic aging anywhere, shown here in the first column as percentage point change in population age 65 plus. Chief among them is China, aging faster than any OECD country except Korea. But pretty much every subregion is represented at the top of this list. India is aging faster than Australia or Germany, for example. And Pacific Island countries are going growing old more slowly, but uh, the direction is still the same. People are living longer, having fewer children, experiencing less co-residence, and rates of adult children that have migrated away are higher than anywhere else. These demographic trends are, of course, the main motivator for why we're having this conversation, to make sure that pension systems are ready. Major constraints to that include high informality, and we'll hear a lot about that today. An estimated 65% of Asia-Pacific employment is in informal sector. It's particularly high in South Asia. Uh, related to that is, for many countries, the ability to tax and therefore spend. Spending capacity is constrained. And finally, existing social pension structures are underdeveloped. In a moment, I'll show you what each country is doing, but you can see in this last column that when it comes to public pension funding, we're talking very little commitment so far. 
Thailand's very well-known social pension is only 0.4% of GDP, which is 1 20th of the OECD average, even though it already has the same population age structure as the OECD average. So that's our context, but let's see what pension structures are in place in the region. First, uh, I'll just say before diving into it, is that there's a lot of variation. That variety of approaches is probably a very unique feature in Asia that you don't see to the same extent uh, of heter heterogeneity elsewhere. Okay, so here we've got social pension schemes, which include universal schemes in Georgia, Timor, Kazakhstan, and Pacific Island countries. In, you can see in the shaded uh, boxes in the first row. In the second row, you can see that there's plenty of means testing from the more inclusive targeting on, in Korea and Philippines to tighter targeting in Malaysia and Mongolia. Some restrict access to an advanced age in that third row there. Um, Indonesia and Vietnam are examples. And some offer some uh, social pensions to those without pension, what's called pension testing. So Thailand and Nepal are examples. But importantly, there's a big gap for some with no social pensions in Cambodia, Laos, Pakistan, Marshall Islands, FSM, PNG, Solomon, and Vanuatu. So these obviously need uh, urgent attention. On main contributory schemes, also there's a lot of differences. Here it's uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar that are lacking. So Bangladesh introduced a scheme last year, so it's still getting going. And Myanmar has legislated but hasn't activated its uh, main contributory scheme. For others, uh, it's either defined benefit, DB, or defined contribution, DC, uh, often provident fund or individual accounts in some cases. Some former uh, Soviet republics have notional defined contribution, uh, and China's empty accounts sometimes are also deemed as NDC, notional uh, defined contribution. So the question here is whether civil servants are integrated with the main private sector scheme, which is what you want. Uh, recent changes in uh, China and Vietnam mean that they're in the process of integrating. Malaysia has just announced an intention to merge. Uh, but many in East and Southeast Asia, as I highlight there, have parallel systems, often excessively generous and uh, where civil servants don't need to contribute to them. Finally, we include here a list of uh, voluntary schemes that have matching contributions, mostly for informal sector. I'll come, come back to some examples in a moment, but just to note that many other voluntary schemes exist that have maybe tax incentives, but this is just highlighting the um, MDC um, matched contributions. Overall, this is what you see uh, nominally that's in place. Uh, some have clearly multi-pillar systems already, a great starting point. Some don't. Some have uh, newer schemes, so uh, different parameters, different designs, and outcomes are very different. So let's look at some of those outcomes. So starting with contributory schemes this time. Once you start looking at these schemes, it becomes apparent that many in Asia have low coverage, mostly because of informality, uh, you see that um, in a strong correlation between the share of labor market informality and mandatory coverage, the more informality as you go towards the right on the horizontal, the less coverage on the vertical. And this has changed very little since the 1990s. What's more, the data is often sketchy and definitions differ, so even the headline numbers may be misleading. So here um, we use membership and you might be a member of a scheme, but actually not necessarily contributing. So contributory density tends to be quite low. So what can we can be done? In the paper, we list a number of options to include more people legislatively and operationally. For example, there's some groups excluded by policy. Some are formal sector employees of small enterprises, for example. Uh, some informal sector with formal sector characteristics where income is monitorable, so uh, some self-employed groups. And so these groups could be progressively included, whereas most countries might start with large employers, you can reduce that threshold um, and increasingly include more, the greater that there is digitalization uh, of transactions and monitorability. Um, where self-employment professional uh, business owners, for example, might you might be able to monitor income, uh, you could also uh, mandate those, so for example, professionals, even at a lower rate. There's also some groups that are included, but whose employers have low compliance, such as internal migrants, which require raising the risk of enforcement and the cost of non-compliance. 
for gig economy workers, there's a there's legal work issues that are being worked through throughout the region, uh, including in developing countries, um, about whether they're employees and whether there can be compulsion. Uh, but there are opportunities to work with platforms as aggregators to catalyze contributions. So Indonesia and Malaysia have examples where they've been doing that. There's also the option to tax platforms. So India in the social security code has recently um, made a provision to oblige platforms to create social security funds with about one to 2% of revenue. Uh, and some states in India are also looking at that. So also um, there's also opportunities in internal international migration space. Often uh, there's no compulsion, no reciprocal arrangements, uh, legal um, barriers, uh, no portability between countries. Uh, so ASEAN has been recently looking at this. Uh, we've done some work for APEC and perhaps ADB would also be interested in that. Uh, one particular policy area that we highlight is the observed expansion of matched contributions in voluntary schemes as an incentive to get people into pension saving. So this started in Sri Lanka in 1989 for farmers and fishers and has been adopted more widely. It varies from contri uh, matching contributions of one to one to as low as 15% uh, in Malaysia. There's typically an annual cap or a lifetime cap. And in some cases, uh, only specific types of employees or low, em low income employees uh, are included. So far, it's seeing some penetration, but still marginal. So for example, 1% of working age in Malaysia, 5% in India, which actually is a large absolute number, Thailand um, doing best at about 12% of working age. But a few years ago, uh, even these would have been hard to come by. We propose that even though modest, the schemes could do a bit more and slowly change the culture uh, around pension saving. And here's a range of seven different strategies that can be used. So for example, adequate matching, ensuring that there's flexibility to these sorts of savings accounts um, so to, to take account of volatile incomes of informal workers. Bundling benefits such as maternity benefits or uh, funeral benefits, uh, simplifying the administrative structure to know your customer requirements for, for bank transfers, um, and uh, using defaults, using aggregators uh, such as unions, work associations, uh, and making sure that there is full range of uh, channels, so from mobiles through to the, the corner kiosk where you could contribute. So while we do bang on about coverage and adequacy throughout, um, the other side of the coin, of course, to this is sustainability and pension design needs to strike that balance between them. So with defined contribution and no notional defined contribution, generally have inbuilt features that uh, make them sustainable. If people live longer, then they have fewer of those account funds uh, to, to spread across their lives. That typically becomes the adequacy problem I've been describing. Um, but it may then become sustainability if you just sort of leave leave that until people have no um, means to support themselves. With DB systems, on the other hand, uh, they may be um, more likely to face sustainability challenges where existing formulas can mean high benefits for full career workers in places like Vietnam and Philippines. But this becomes more of a problem when the ratio of contributors to beneficiaries changes, and then you have to um, account for that by cutting benefits often, as has happened in, throughout OECD Europe. A couple of other points here. One strategy uh, within, especially within DB systems, uh, is to um, have progressive benefit formulas and internally redistributive features. So things like caps and flat rates and minimum floors and, and wage, the way that you uh, average wages. So this chart shows you examples of net replacement rate comparisons between full career workers, male workers at half of average wage and twice of average wage and the comparison between them. And the ones on the right, you can see that there's, a, there's much larger gaps, uh, whereas those um, towards the, the left um, at the bottom, much less so, uh, and so they, they, they have less redistributive elements within their schemes. Another feature, um, design feature that keeps the system balanced over time uh, and um, making sure that the balance between adequacy and sustainability is maintained is indexation. So making sure that benefits and thresholds, include, including you know things that um, like uh, valorization that pension economists refer to when, when valuing historic wages. Uh, these keep systems steady over time. 
uh, and you don't want benefits to erode as a country grows uh, and develops, and that balance between adequacy and sustainability to, to tip in the wrong direction. So that's contributory pensions, uh, but as we've seen, these aren't enough. We need social schemes, uh, so let's turn to those. So this chart shows you the reach of social pensions on the horizontal axis and the benefit level on the vertical axis. The general pattern you'll observe, besides, of course, absence of schemes that I mentioned before, is that Asian economies have either low benefits, low coverage, or both, or indeed absent. It also explains the low spending we saw in that early slide um, in that column. Remember that the observed coverage here is a function of targeting rules. So you see Timor and Georgia with universal schemes on the right, um, and Thailand, which has uh, uh, pension testing, so civil servants aren't entitled to uh, the, the scheme, and so the, the coverage is a bit lower, uh, all the way through to um, tighter targeting on the left, uh, age-tested schemes, Nepal age 70, Vietnam effectively age 80, uh, and so when you're dividing by the population age 60 plus, that becomes a much smaller number that's covered. And as for benefits on the vertical axis, you can see that Asia is below global average and certainly below OECD average uh, for a lot of countries. So a key recommendation is that that needs addressing, uh, so let's see how that might work uh, in practice. So this is an illustration that we ran some simulations of poverty impact of raising the benefit level, here showing India and Thailand. And as you can see, increasing the benefit along the right axis, moving rightwards uh, along the horizontal towards the global and OECD average benefit, you get a significant poverty reduction. The dots there show you the current level location um, is sort of approximate because the modeled line shows universal coverage of 65 plus. So India, you can see a reduction from 63 all the way through to 48% poverty rate uh, from 16, for Thailand from 16 to 2%, just reminding you that that's slightly different poverty lines drawn. Also remember that um, pegging the pensions to a GDP, a proportion of GDP or wages, means that poverty reduction that you see here would be even greater as the economy develops. Uh, because that poverty line obviously is an absolute value and the GDP would increase and, and increase the, the benefits. So that's positive, but what about the fiscal impact? Uh, you can see that uh, here, um, currently spending is minuscule. The increase in benefit would still see modest levels of spending by OECD standards, below 3% uh, in Thailand to reach the global benefit level, which is actually an enviable cost ratio for most OECD countries. Of course, costs would rise with population aging, uh, but here's where other policy levers can come in, uh, namely targeting. So just remember that 2.9% and 1.2% that you see there, uh, because we're going to see how targeting might affect that. And you can see that 2.9 and 1.2 reducing on the left um, with greater means testing as fewer people are included in the pension, and on the right, uh, how that cost reduces with higher access ages. So it doesn't take much to keep the keep it to manageable cost thresholds. Uh, this is a fairly basic scenario analysis, but it gives you a flavor of the magnitude of impacts when you combine benefit increases with targeting. So we suggest in the paper that, and we're not the first to do so, uh, that doing more with social pensions is a viable direction forward to bridge, bridge the coverage and adequacy gaps. Of course, implementation matters, and there's examples of it done better and worse with ex excessive exclusion areas. So for example, Malaysia and Vietnam might be possible examples where there's significant exclusion areas with some of their means testing. Um, perhaps we'll hear a little bit uh, about Vietnam from Long on that. I would just add that probably pension testing is the most promising option for most. Uh, so cheap and easy to administer with already existing records. But overall, policymakers should be open to expand targeting as technology advances. Okay, so that's the main messages, uh, but there's a bunch of other design considerations that should be on the reform agenda. I'll just run through them fairly quickly. Um, uh, you'll find more details in the paper that I invite you to look at. First up is gender dimension. Uh, currently, women have worse outcomes in contributory pensions, reflecting their labor market experience. So lower participation, lower formality, lower density of contributions uh, means that they get less of contributory pensions. And this is where social pensions benefit women really the most. 
uh, incidentally, it tends to also um, benefit vulnerable groups more, including ethnic minorities. But there are simple contributory scheme parametric changes that can help too, uh, which we list here. Uh, there's generosity of survivor benefits. So in some countries, you get the full benefit, like the Philippines, whereas in others, you only get a fraction uh, in places like Korea and Mongolia and Uzbekistan. Not only generosity, but also the form of survivor benefits matters. So in China, Indonesia, and Thailand, you just get a lump sum with no protection throughout older age. We could better account for child caring breaks. Vietnam and Timor do that. Uh, already talked about internal redistribution within the benefit formulas, especially for DB. Another way of doing it is uh, with unisex mortality tables. So since women live longer, an annuity would pay less. Uh, OECD have phased out uh, um, differential mortality tables. Um, and that way, essentially, men would be subsidizing women with it within the annuity contracts on the insurance side. Uh, this is not the case in Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, for example. Also, different access ages, uh, the same kind of problem uh, should be really looked at. It's still uh, 50 for many Chinese women, which is kind of surprising given that uh, female life expectancy in China has surpassed the US recently. As you can see, gender responsive design can make a big difference here uh, across various schemes. Work incentives are also another common concern. You give people early pensions, they might retire earlier. Uh, so that's a concern for some policymakers. Uh, and this is where access ages are a key lever to deal with it, uh, sometimes controversial but necessary parameters to adjust. In OECD, some of that um, controversy has been taken out of the equation by linking uh, the, the access ages to life expectancy. There's also an argument that it could be uh, linked to healthy life expectancy instead of life expectancy. Uh, but that's another uh, area to, to, um, to talk about. Uh, also, work tests and incentives matter. Uh, offering more benefits for later retirements can do that, for example. And not forcing people to retire to receive a benefit if, the, if it's above a certain given age. Another trade-off here might be um, that when you offer pensions, the result might be a reduction or crowding out of transfers from the family. Uh, there's mixed effects of this. Uh, globally, globally, the average is a 27% reduction in um, public trans in uh, family transfers. Uh, less so in Asia, even some crowding in, uh, for example, 20% extra in Nepal. But maybe conceptually, it's a sort of problematic area, uh, withholding rights-based benefits um, uh, for worries for discretionary family help to be withdrawn. I don't know. Uh, I mentioned that sustainability, I think I hear a beeping, which I think I'm almost out of time. I mentioned sustainability before. One design feature is the inclusion of automatic adjustment stabilizers, for, particularly for DB. For example, if the ratio of contributors to beneficiaries changes, you could offset by, that by reducing the benefits or increasing the contributions. Uh, pensions promises need to survive for a very long time, so need good governance. There's a lot of great examples of uh, where good governments uh, good governance exists, including principles, principles from ISA and IOPS, and a few of them I've listed there. If you look at recent revision of Chinese policy for supervision of social insurance funds, uh, you see a lot of these same sort of principles expressly stated. It would overcome issues that we've seen in the 1990s and 2000s in places like Kazakhstan and, and Pacific Islands, where there's been uh, embezzlement. Uh, fifth one, learning lessons from the pandemic. Uh, so we document a whole range of responses uh, throughout the pandemic uh, that countries have done, but some may have gone too far. So for example, in Malaysia, after four rounds of withdrawals, assets have declined by 15% and millions of members with no funds, which uh, exacerbates the coverage and adequacy uh, issues. So the lesson there is to be able to balance the short-term shocks against the much larger shock of population aging that's coming in the longer term. Uh, sixth, very quick, is um, thinking about behavior, in financial behavior imposed by pension systems. Uh, this can be done by looking at what the choice architecture of pensions is, uh, particularly important for DC system, systems. I demonstrate that here by looking at uh, compulsion through to a free choice across the life cycle and what does each uh, pension system uh, impose. So the Australian example here, which I won't go through, 
is that uh, there might be a lot of compulsion and defaults early on, but much more laissez-faire approach towards uh, later life, an area that OECD countries are grappling with. Final point uh, is about finding opportunities in tech advances. Chart shows uh, big increases over the decade in shares with bank accounts and already large shares receiving transfers into those accounts. It means policymakers can think about better use of digital biometric IDs, better information dissemination, more digital mobile payments. Uh, examples of innovation could also be consumption-based pensions, which we can talk about if it comes up. Uh, so that's the run through. You know the story already, low coverage and low adequacy, but the worst impacts can be avoided with, with some reforms, uh, big agenda, and we're glad that ADB is at the forefront of it. Thank you, and I welcome uh, questions and the discussion. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, so before we start with the panel portion of uh, the webinar, I will open the floor to Long for some okay. comments and discussions to, to your presentation. Long, please, the floor is yours. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation about the, uh, you know, aging population in Asia and some other country as well as, you know, pension uh, ongoing and reforms. I think that's quite uh, important, you know, policy implication for many countries uh, from uh, the low income to advanced or high income country. So there are some key observations that I want to share with, uh, with you. The first one, uh, as you can see in the sample, mostly we mentioned about the middle-income country. So they have a high rate of uh, older person, high rate of informality for the labor market. And at the same time, they have low rate of tax per uh, uh, GDP and also uh, social uh, pension spending. So it's quite uh, contradictory and also challenging situation for the middle-income country facing with uh, very rapidly aging population uh, like Vietnam. I will discuss later. The second one is that, uh, you know, uh, most, mostly they have quite separate between the contributory pension and also non-contributory or social pension. It's not really a multi-layer system, you know, to uh, guarantee income for the OH. The second one is that, uh, you know, uh, the contributory pension uh, cover very limited, uh, you know, older person, but uh, it provides a better uh, benefit. Uh, compared with uh, the uh, non-contributory pension, with both low, uh, you know, very low uh, coverage and also very low benefit level. Uh, last but not least, you know, uh, sometimes some country, uh, including Vietnam, use uh, the voluntary pension scheme as uh, you know the way to expand the uh, social insurance system, especially the pension system, and that is why. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, as also shown by uh, Rafan presentation and also in the case of Vietnam, I mean, it's kind of like that. It's really limited in terms of function. So my argument, uh, you know, uh, and also question from the, uh, the presentation by Rafan is that the pension system design and implementation are involved in both, you know, intra and intergenerational, uh, you know, generation. And that is why when we think about uh, designing the pension system, uh, facing the aging population, I think we uh, not only take into account the current older person, uh, talking about, you know, expansion the coverage by social pension, but also we need to think about, you know, how much the tax uh, we will use in, uh, you know, uh, from the future generation in order to uh, finance uh, the one who not join with the contributory pension later. The second one is that uh, the same as ADB and also many other research already mentioned. We need to uh, focus on the multi-layer income system so that we have like a basic income security, and then you know we have uh, the income based on what uh, worker you know contribute to the system. The third one is that um, uh, the sustainable pension system should rely on you know mostly on the contributory pension system. That is my 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 personal uh, thought because you know we we are working now we contribute to the system and we, we receive pension when we retire, rather than, you know, like uh, you don't contribute anything. And when you, uh, at the certain age, I, I mean, eligible age, you will get non-contributory uh, pension from uh, government, uh, you know, which is tax-based, uh, you know, financing. And then, you know, it will become like a vicious circle of uh, taxation and also even like a double burden for the future generation to, you know, to finance uh, the heavy non-contributory pension in, in, in the country. 
uh, particularly for the uh, the country with high rate of informality like Vietnam and also many other country in Rafan's presentation. I think that uh, you know uh, voluntary system doesn't work well, and it already proved uh, by statistic. So I think that you know compulsory uh, you know should be prioritized. You know and and uh, uh, you know we will have uh, more and more uh, people you know exposed in the labor market, and I think that is possible for for the country like Vietnam and and also many other country with high rate of informality to apply the compulsory. So I have two uh, questions for. Uh, Rafan and and Pip also. Uh, the first one is that uh, when we apply, uh, you know, the social pension, it means tax based system. You know, uh, how can we consider about the fiscal space? You know, for the country, uh, almost you know, limited in terms of uh, uh, government budget. Particularly uh, for the country after the COVID uh, nineteen pandemic, you know, they spend a lot of money for supporting uh, people with low income and also like vulnerable group. So. When we think about expanding the social pension, right? So it means we we need to get uh, more types. So how the fiscal space should uh, should be you know uh, considered in in that sense. The second question is that uh, even you know we we have a higher coverage, but actually it depends on you know how much we provide to older person with uh, social pension. So the question about adequacy of the the benefit is also important. Uh, like the case of Vietnam. You know, uh, we already increased the benefit level by 25% uh, from the last uh, decision to the, the most uh, recent decision. But actually, in terms of purchasing power, you know, compared with the first year of social pension, uh, the purchasing, purchasing power just only 70%. So what I mean is that we, you increase in terms of nominal value, but actually the actual values decrease because of inflation and also, you know, because of cost of living. So even you adjust the the the, uh, the social pension level, but the question about adequacy is also important. So that's my two questions for for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Long, for this uh, insightful discussion. Uh, v. Braff, do you want to uh, take on these questions? Pip, did you want to? Oh. Uh, well, maybe maybe I'll start. Um, thank you, Long, and um, I think your points are, are very well taken. I mean, the first one on the, I think, general point you made on the layering of a system and the interaction of the various pillars between social, contributory, and you know, again, voluntary at the high end, is very well taken. I think that's your observation that in Asia, most of the systems are not designed in thinking about how those pieces interact is very well taken. There are certainly examples in from other parts of the world where there are, that is done much more thoughtfully. Chile is a, is a great example, I think, of that, where there's tapering and all kinds of things. Australia is another one. Um, but they tend to need more administrative data, more um, administrative capacity to do them well. Um, so I think the direction you outlined makes a lot of sense. Um, the administrative capacity to do it in a fine-tuned way, I think, for many countries still has some way to go. On the fiscal space on social pensions, um, I think, uh, I, again, your your point is well taken. I mean, and as Raf's pictures showed, you know, if, you, if you're overly generous and you have ageing, it, it can really blow out the budget. Um, that said, I think you have to think first about the function of the social pension, and that's very much a poverty kind of function. It's not trying to replace income in the way, you know, a contributory thing would be income smoothing. Um, so I, I think that's where these layering matters. So they're, it's performing part of the function, but but not all. Um, how they're financed, as you said, is general revenues. Um, it's a much bigger tax story. I think most of our countries probably have to con tax consumption more than they do. That would also address the intergenerational issue because you know everybody's consuming. Um, there's always the regressivity issues around that, of course, uh, which, which come in. But but certainly consumption seems one. Um, the second would be property taxes and other things that are very underdeveloped in Asia. A third would be reallocation of existing spending, particularly on subsidies, which we know are regressive and in some countries are really pronounced. So firstly, there's some fiscal space already there that is going in the wrong direction at the moment, and that's subsidies. Secondly, there needs to be much broader tax reform in many of these countries to raise aggregate revenues to create the fiscal space. The third point I, I would say is that whilst 
we certainly don't disagree that contributory should continue and ideally expand, whether mandatory or voluntary, and, and RAF outline various ways. The fact is that demographics, as they advance, drive you to a point where even in very formal economies, that's not enough. Japan finances half its basic pension from sales tax. Germany is going in the same direction. Beyond a certain point with demographics, general revenues kick in, whether that's subsidising the contributory system or going the social pension route. So, um, you know, I think that's an inevitability, almost whatever system you have beyond a certain point of demographics. I'll stop there. I would just add one more thing to that, that when it comes to pe within pensions, uh, reallocation. So we did propose things like you know, looking at civil servant pensions that can bring release some of that uh, those funds. Um, the targeting itself could limit some of that spending on social. Um, and access ages are another sort of area where you can limit um, the the amount of spending uh, both on on contributory and, and social. Thank you. Thank you for, for these responses. So uh, Long also highlighted the issue of, of adequacy of benefits, which I think is, is something that uh, that perhaps we need to to look at. So I wonder if you have also some some additional thoughts on that, uh, the, the adequacy of benefits of contributory versus non-contributory and how to, to really look at that to make sure that uh, people at older ages are effectively protected. Yeah, so the example that Long gave was about the 25% in, in, increase um, that was given, and that wasn't enough. And so that's one of the things that we we mentioned in, in the paper and in the presentation a few times, the, the really need for indexation of benefits. Um, this, uh, you know, without linking benefits to inflation or to wages, people get left behind and that benefit um, stops having value. That's happening in various countries, in Thailand, in Korea. Uh, so it, it's, it's a common thing. Sometimes policymakers don't want to index uh, benefits because it allows them to erode them by stealth. Uh, but um, it's, it's a very important feature to, to have within pension systems to keep the balance within the system going and make sure that the pension benefits aren't eroded over time as a country develops and prices grow. On the, if I just add to that, on the contributory side, I think that the issues differ a little bit across the region. There are some countries where contributions are just too low to give you an adequate benefit in retirement. I think of um, Indone um, Indonesia, Korea, Thailand, the, the contributions are just too low to generate real consumption smoothing. So that that's one question there. The, the second, um, I think, would be that for most of the DB schemes, they do generate adequate benefits if you have a full career and, and reasonable density. Um, so, But many people don't, as we know, particularly women. So I think that needs to be thought about um, a lot more. On the social pension side, they will never, as I said before, perform that full consumption smoothing function that was intended for social insurance. They will at best perform a poverty reduction function, but at the moment, as as Long said and as Raf presented, you know, if you're getting five percent of uh, per capita income, that's clearly not doing either. Um, so, you know, it really, and that's where the trade-off between coverage and adequacy really needs to be thought about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you I'd like to talk a bit about. Response. Sorry, Long. Uh, so I, I would like to move uh, on to talk a bit about the informal sector and the challenges it poses on the on the pension system. So according to the recently published ADPR report, participation in contributory schemes is, is below 10% of the working age population in several economies. We have also seen these during the presentation. We have also heard that 65% of the workforce in, in countries in Asia is uh, in the informal sector. So... I would like to reflect a bit on what are the steps that government should be taking in ensuring that uh, pension coverage increases among informal sector workers. And please, Aiko, I, I would give the floor to you to, to start reflecting on that. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and also the questions. So yes, informality is one of the key hindrance that uh, this uh, ADPR report, Aging and Well, have tackled as one of the key uh, uh, key 
issues that the, we would need to tackle. I think we can approach this from two angles. One is that informal older workers who fall out of uh, being having an access to the contributory pension and that, that they would need immediate help. And I think, and also other part is that the current working age population, which you mentioned that the low coverage of their uh, coverage contribution or the membership to the current uh, pension plan. So in terms of the first group, the informal older workers uh, who in our report, we estimate about 94% of the older workers are working in the informal sectors, and they would not be much in a position to you know, contribute for the future when they are already at the old age. So here, uh, really the important aspect is that to have social pension as the earlier uh, presentation have shown, and also to have much more uh, kick from the labor protection side. I think one of the uh, question from Q&A was talking about the you know, disability allowance and other uh, you know, basic labor protection. If, if there has been a work injuries, if there has been some uh, aspect of the work life that has caused uh, and they, uh, incapacities and so on, those protections do not really go to these workers, regardless of the age. So that uh, really has to be addressed. So informal older workers protection is one aspect. And the other is the current working age population who fall out of uh, having an access to the contributory pension. And uh, Rafael's presentation already highlighted this uh, seven aspect where they could really uh, leverage. And that the um, I would like to stress very much the flexibility of that system, especially a, a system of voluntary contribution scheme and the importance of that and how uh, the reality of the work among informal workers is not that they might be always in the informal sector, but they might be moving from formal to informal, unemployed to formals. So uh, this very uh, fluidity of the labor force that we see in developing Asia has to be really reflected in the pension uh, contributory scheme as well. So start a little bit more flexible, maybe towards, a, a, you know, in the more face manner, the compulsory and, you know, a little bit more difficult to withdraw type of approach can be introduced. But having at the start, uh, having a good announcement effect of having a contributory stream, voluntary scheme where people can start contributing uh, with the flexibility would be a key really to uh, address this uh, informality, which is very pervasive. And we don't see a lot of change in that and something that the government would uh, continue to have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you, Aiko. Uh, I would like to turn now to, to Long. So you mentioned uh, earlier about the uh, recent uh, reform of the social insurance law in, in Vietnam. Perhaps you can tell us a bit more about that and how this reform is, is taking a step towards uh, universal coverage of, of pensions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in uh, June uh, uh, this year, uh, you know, the National Assembly of Vietnam already approved the amended uh, social insurance law in Vietnam. And uh, there are uh, a number of uh, reforms and changes in uh, the law so that we can expand both uh, horizontally coverage. It means, you know, the more and more ben uh, uh, participant and also uh, vertical uh, coverage, it means a benefit level. So the first one is that, uh, and very important, that people already mentioned, we integrate the social pension and non uh, and contributory pension into a layer, a multi-layer pension system. So that, you know, we try to guarantee uh, all people who retire, you know, with minimum income, and then we can diversify the uh, income sources for the you know beneficiary that is a very important one because uh, we we you know uh, integrate uh, the two separate systems together you know to provide uh, good income sources for for people the second one is that we expand uh, the uh, mandatory uh, pension scheme to register business owner a cooperative uh, manager without salary and more importantly, like worker with uh, contract-like labor relation, like uh, you know, grabber, because grabber, because uh, before that they they don't have any uh, labor contract, but they can have their own income, but without contribution to social insurance. So now you know we uh, we will include them in the uh, mandatory system, so that we can expand the uh, the coverage. Uh, the next one is that we also provide more uh, you know benefit uh, scheme for people who join with voluntary uh, system, particularly for the uh, maternity leave, because it is very important. 
like I go mentioned, you know, mostly in the uh, informal sector, uh, we will have more women than men, something like that. And, uh, you know, maternity is really important for them, especially for young people. That is why the first thing we expand the, the benefit scheme. And then also the same thing that uh, the group one that I already mentioned in her, uh, her talk, uh, you know, we uh, reduce the number of contribution uh, year for the people who already you know, missed the opportunity to, to join with the system. So instead of uh, normal like 20 years contribution, we reduce to, you know, 15 years or even think about, about 10 years, you know, so that we can uh, uh, open the eligibility for the people who missed the chance to join at the beginning of their working life. Last but not least, and also very important, and also it was hot debate among uh, you know uh, people. I mean the uh, drafter of the, the law and also people at the legislative is that lump sum withdrawal. You know, so uh, when the the new law uh, will be enacted uh, from next July, uh, there will be no uh, lump sum withdrawal. You know, for the new uh, party participant, and we stop uh, fully the lump sum payment. Because uh, in, in the past six years, you know, the number of people who uh, withdraw from the system almost the same as the new entrant. And that is why we could not see any kind of, uh, you know, significant improve in the coverage of the pension system. And I think, I personally think that, uh, uh, you know, stop lump sum withdrawal is very important policy for uh, reforming the social insurance system in Vietnam uh, in the new law. That's, that's all key, uh, you know, key point uh, for the new law in Vietnam. Thank you, Long. Um, so, I would like to take uh, take on on some some of the aspects that were discussed during the presentation, and 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 also you pointed out, uh, which is the fact that men and women do have very uh, different learning profiles, and therefore very different uh, levels of uh, coverage in terms of contributory pensions and uh, non contributory as well. Uh, so uh, turning turning to ICO, taking a gender lens, what are some of the steps that uh, that governments can take to make sure that pension gaps are reduced, and more generally that women are well protected at older ages? Thank you, Sylvia. When uh, in this report we look at the profile of all the current level of uh, current. Uh, pool of older person in detail to really understand what are the sources of uh, pension coverage gap. And the first thing that really strike us is that there are a large group of women, especially in particular a region like South, Africa, South Asia, where they have never worked group is so large, uh, constituting about half or well over half of the group. This group would not have any opportunity to contribute to uh, work-related pensions or even to perhaps the voluntary scheme because they will not have uh, additional earning to be contributing. So for this type of group, which are currently the majority in our uh, region, and also perhaps number will be declining, but would continue to have a significant portion, they would need two aspects. One is this uh, minimum guarantee, as uh, has already been mentioned, social pensions or other type of uh, uh, social securities that support the minimum life standard. And second is to uh, to 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 look at the survivor's pension, which uh, the main income earners uh, share would be coming, would be uh, equally shared to the women's side, not just as a lump sum, but as a continuous, uh, and the, also the indication of their contribution to the earned income of the partner. Um, second, though, is on this uh, contributory scheme. So as I mentioned, there will be a growing number of women who have participated in a labor force who will be working longer. Uh, however, the life cycle approach of or their working life cycle, especially of the women where they have childbirth or uh, caring for uh, family members, have not really been well reflected in the current pension system flexibilities are lacking or that they would put burden on the contribution to the firm who would give them maternity leaves, etc. So uh, this understanding of the life cycle of uh, career, uh, which primarily women at this point, but it would also be increasingly more men who will be taking on household responsibility, has to be well built into the pension system. And that some of the uh, reform that the loan has mentioned uh, are a very uh, important step towards that. And also realistic, uh, adjusting the pension to the real working style of the people and are some of the important steps to be taken. 
Thank you, Aiko. I would like to turn to a question of the audience that has been repeated uh, multiple times, and it's about the discussion, the ongoing di discussion about lowering retirement ages. And uh, so Shivendra Sain uh, mentions that, um, of course, lowering retirement ages would result in longer periods of pension provision. However, there's also the challenge of ensuring sufficient employment opportunities for the younger population. So what would be the best way to balance these competing demands and whether you would have any thoughts of these? Uh, Pete, perhaps you can take, a, or Raf, uh, uh, either of you can take a I'm happy to just, this question. Uh, so this comes up very often in pension discussions. Uh, it's called the lump of labor fallacy. Uh, the idea that uh, there is one lump of uh, work that's available of jobs, not a certain number of jobs that's available in an economy. If that were true, as a country gets bigger, it would everyone knew would become unemployed. But actually, uh, as the economy expands and as the economy changes, uh, the population expands. So do the number of jobs. So it, it's it's uh, it's a fallacy to say that if uh, older people retired, uh, then there'd be more jobs for younger people. Because actually, the opposite might be true. Because you'd have less production in the economy in general, and, and the economy would be poorer for it. Um, when you look at correlations between countries where older people uh, have higher participation rates, uh, and um, uh, you look at unemployment of young people, uh, you, you see a, a correlation where more older people working means lower unemployment for younger people in, in general. Uh, so it's it's a very common thing. It comes up a lot, but uh, it's, 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 it's got a name. Even. Yeah, I, I would just reiterate that. I mean, Jonathan Gruber and others for the OECD have shown that empirically over many countries and many times. For developing countries, I think there's a lot less evidence. Um, there's a recent study for Latin America that looks at this and finds just what Raf said, that, that, that there is, in fact, no trade-off between the older and the younger uh, employment rates. Uh, work's been done on China that also shows that. Um, but it's not, I think it's, it, it, there's still more work to be done carefully, I think, in developing countries to look at this. And there are certain sectors where it may be true, public sector, for example, where you're likely to have limits on employment, you know, it, it may be true there. But in general, that trade-off, we just don't observe it very strongly in, in many countries. Um can I say something about retirement ages? It's, it's always in this area, it's always one of the most heated, you know, people get on the streets and there's always trouble when, whenever retirement ages, when they talk about putting them up. Um, and the French, as we know, were just talking about lowering them also in the recent election campaigns. Um, I think the future is probably not to have this rigid retirement ages that we've had in the past. The, the best practice in the world nowadays are the Swedens, the UKs and others that don't actually have a retirement age as such. And we should be thinking not about retirement ages, but access ages. What's the minimum age at which you can access your entitlement to a pension, whether it's DB or DC or whatever. And that shouldn't necessarily be related to your work status or other things. Um, and once you start thinking in that different way, I think... That, that's where it's going to have to go because you can't endlessly have these debates about we're going to put up retirement age a year or whatever. To the extent that you do keep it in that system of, you know, retirement ages, um, I think the things Raf mentioned, automatic linking of retirement age to increases in life expectancy or healthy life expectancy, if you do that, it becomes a technocratic exercise a bit more and it takes some of the heat out of some of the pain politically because it is painful politically and socially. We know that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I will turn to another question uh, from the audience. Uh, Romulo Virola asks, are artificial intelligence tools already being used in formulating policies on social security programs? Uh, so I'm. I wonder if uh, if you have any any thoughts on that, any knowledge on on whether artificial intelligence is already making it into into the formulation of, of policy. Can Can I give an example more from the health side? It's in fact being used quite more and more in the health insurance side, social health insurance. 
Um, so to look at the profiles of people and the expectations that they would fall ill, that they'd become disabled, that they would die, et cetera, and, and looking at that. And the United States, for example, has been using this in various states and predictive artificial intelligence kind of stuff. The Israelis have used it and others. And it's really powerful that when you use that information and then target populations with information about, say, the things that are likely to increase their risk of disability or death or whatever, um, you get really quite powerful reductions in morbidity, uh, in hospital usage and things like that. So I think certainly on the health insurance side, that's very de demonstrated. Disability benefits, it's also been used in a number of countries in a similar kind of way. And it's used in a kind of constructive way to target information and, and to kind of proactive, it's like preventive kind of measures can be more targeted and, and, and the message is sharpened and the outcomes seem to be improved from that. I'm less aware on the pension side, I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Pip. So I think we're uh, reaching the end of our webinar. So I'll give the opportunity to all speakers to have some closing, very quick closing words, and then we will uh, we will adjourn the the webinar. Uh, Raf, do you want to begin? Sure. I mean, uh, it's. Uh... It's, it's as we mentioned in the presentation that the big story really is about uh, seeking to close that coverage and and um, an adequacy gap. Uh, and we have some tools, uh, and I think it's important to take them seriously because population aging is happening, and we're we're kind of slowly getting there. Uh, and the uh, the risk of leaving it too long means an adjustment later down the line, uh, which could become uh, very expensive. Uh, more expensive potentially because you haven't prepared and you haven't saved up for it. Long, please. Or be yeah, for me, uh, anytime we discuss about policy, I always talk about you know uh, three A's uh, as usual: accessibility, affordability, and adequacy. You know, we need to think about both. You know, uh, uh, and the other way for intergeneration and also intergeneration in designing the policy. Thank you. Maybe I can just throw in, I hate to throw in a new thing, but Raf mentioned it along the way right at the end. We've always tended to tax labour income. And um, as labour becomes more, uh, you know, with ageing becomes uh, more scarce, that's probably not such a sensible idea. So I think we need to think about all kinds of innovations. Um, Consumption-based pensions would be one where you do micro contributions at the point of consumption um, and that adds up over time. It may not, it certainly won't solve the whole problem, but I think innovations like that that we see in Mexico, in Spain, in the private sector in China are probably elements of the way forward that don't really exist yet. So it's going to be a mosaic of things. It's not going to be a single silver bullet that's contributory or social pensions or whatever. It'll be a mosaic and layered and there'll be different or new elements of that mosaic have to come in over time, like a consumption pension. Thank you. Aiko, do you want to, to have a word or? Sure. Uh, maybe just as a last speaker, I would like to uh, mention that, uh, you know, pension is one of the key element that ensures the well-being of or the person. And in this report that we just published, the uh, Aging Well in Asia, we also look at it, uh, other angles of uh, well-being, which also complement the financial well-being that is discussed here. One is about the health, other is about the work itself, and also more of the social uh, engagement that people have in the community that also contribute perhaps more to the psychological well-being of all the person. So I really uh, also encourage the audience here who joined us to look at the uh, report. And also, if you have any comments, we're happy to receive them. Thank you. Thank you, Aiko. And uh, taking advantage of that, I will, uh, in, in, in the slide, you will now soon see the uh, link to be able to download this report and learn more about this uh, aging well in, in Asia. So we encourage you to, to scan this QR code and, and download the report. 
And with that, uh, I would like to, before we close this, this webinar, I would like to invite you to join our next Asian Impact Webinar on the Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2024 launch to be held on the 22nd of August uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Manila time, also like today via Zoom. So please check, uh, check out our Asian Impact Webinar webpage and the Chief Economist X account for more updates. Thank you and see you again.